Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome to our overview video of Destiny of the World. Now this is a World War II strategic level game. And this is a review copy of the game provided by Fiddlyware Software. In this video, we're going to jump in. We're gonna take a look at a big picture view of the game. Then we're gonna look at some of the features and mechanics of the game. Then we're gonna take Germany and see if we can invade and conquer Poland in September of 1939. Let's jump in and get started. Now, first up, to kind of give you a, a scope, a kind of a sense of the scale of the game, we have an active game, so we're just gonna do that. Now, in the game, you can play one of eight nations, Germany, Japan, or Italy as the Axis, United Kingdom, United States, Soviet Union, France, or China as the allies. And now, I'm playing this game at a lower resolution because there isn't a way to enlarge the text and keep the, resol the resolution high. So this does go up to on my full screen here. It can be quite big, but I'm playing it on a lower resolution so that we can read all the text on the video and things like that. Now, there are eight levels of intelligence. Uh, we're going to play at the default level, which is three. It goes all the way up to general, which is eight, or private, which is one. We're going to leave it there. We're going to come back out of this. We're going to come in and chain our uh, kind of pick our nation first, because I think this option screens here that we take a look at gives us an idea of that that boundary between hypothetical and to what degree this is going to play out in a historical way. And my general sense of the game is that you've got a lot of options to explore the hypothetical World War II in this game. And yet at the same time, there are not there are a number of kind of hard-coded events into the game that you can stick kind of to the true and narrow World War II path if you'd like to do that as well. In this option screens, I think this is in this option screen, this is where you can kind of break away from some of those traditional constraints that would normally kind of dictate a World War II strategic level game. So for just to kind of name a couple here, early one is early USA entry into the war. So if you check this, USA can enter the war immediately, which might be interesting to do if you're playing the USA. Likewise, there's options for that for Italy and the USSR. We've got a Turkey joins the Axis option, a Sp uh, Axis option, option, Spain joins the Axis option, no Operation Barbarossa, so Germany will not attack USSR unless attack attacked first no Finnish war, and so on and so forth. No Pearl Harbor, no Pearl Harbor. So USA entry is delayed, no Japanese surprise attack or bonus. So a lot of different options that you can click and kind of change the nature of your game. So we're gonna leave all those on the defaults there. We're gonna come in here and let's get started and pick a game um, that we're gonna start. So let's take Germany. And you, all games start in August of 1939. I think it ends up being September by the time we get there. We'll click start here and we'll let the engine create a game. And I want to show you us the screen here. That was pretty fast, actually. So Germany invades Poland. World War II has started. We are in charge of Germany. We can, Germany, we can see the top left-hand corner. We can see the date on the screen. Let's get rid of that. I do want to kind of kind of scroll around here and let you see, take a look at the map. Now, I can see a lot more of the map when we're playing on this. This is zoomed actually all the way out at this resolution. We're looking down here now at Africa. You can see that all of these provinces are kind of active in the game world. We're looking at Russia, which is massive, goes over here to the east. We should end up here. Now we are in uh, India and China, of course, kind of over here, Calcutta. We've got Japan and it's uh, occupied mainland right there. So all the Japanese provinces, we've got the Pacific theater, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, some of the dictated kind of historic islands. We can come down to Australia and New Zealand and say hi to everybody over there. Then we can kind of continue going across Wake Island, Hawaii, crossing the Pacific now. Now on a bigger resolution, this is much more visible as to which land masses these are. We're in Mexico, United States now, of course, uh, but zoomed in at this 1360 by 768, which seemed to give us a good look at this text. That will allow you on the video to see this. But in on your screen, when you play it on a lar larger resolution, it's gonna be a much wider view and you can see much more of the map here. So let's, however, get back to Europe. We can see plenty of the map that we want. We're gonna zoom right in here now into Germany and we can see that Germany is carved up into a number of these different provinces and areas, each with a lot of different kind of historical artifact kind of uh, production and elements that are that are factored in there. And we can see Poland. Our first target is over here to the east. But before we invade Poland, let's just kind of do an overview of some of the features of the game, because we've got a lot here. And I do want to even before we kind of do that, I also want to do kind of a step back moment because it was right about here where I asked myself a very important question. Why would I play this game instead of Hearts of Iron 4? And interestingly enough, I think there are three reasons why you may want to explore this game 
um, it, it, and as opposed to, in addition to, or as opposed to Hearts of Iron 4, because taking nothing away from the fantastic game engine that Hearts of Iron 4 is. So uh, first up, one thing is, and this the designer mentions this. So uh, the designer played uh, Hearts of Iron 4 and didn't like the real-time nature of it. His feeling was either the game, nothing was happening for long stretches of the game and you're kind of waiting for something to happen, or something happens and it goes so fast that it's really hard to manage. Now, most people, when they, and they play Hearts of Iron 4 and something like that happens, they go, let's go eat lunch. But that's not what the people at Fiddlyware Software did. The people at Fiddlyware Software said, no, let's spend thousands of hours making our own strategic World War II game, except let's make it a simultaneous turn-based game. So if I had to say one thing that was a big difference between Hearts of Iron 4 and this in terms of gameplay, it's that simultaneous turn-based engine. So what we're going to do is we're going to plot all of the German moves, all of the actions, and then we're going to hit the end turn button. All the allies are going to plot their moves and our, 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 our allies and the allied forces will plot their moves and they're simultaneously executed. We kind of watch those act out on the map. Each turn is a week and the war continues on and on. You can really kind of take it in almost any direction you want as any of these nations. So that's reason number one. The second reason why you might want to explore this one is um, it's a budget software. So it's I think it I think it's 20 US and all 20 USA dollars or right around there for the cost of the game. And there's no DLC. Now, Hearts of Iron 4, if you explore, there's a lot of DLC now. So the cost of getting into this game is quite a bit less than you would if you're looking at getting at Hearts of Iron 4 if you want to go past that kind of core game experience and that core engine. So there's a second thing there. Um, now, obviously, one other comparison here is the graphics, right? This is a budget piece. I think this might be, a, it, there's very few develop. this is indie studio, very few developers in this. It might actually be a labor of love done almost entirely by one person, which is an amazing accomplishment as we'll see and we start to look at some of that depth. So a third reason might be you want to support this type of indie development, indie software development where people take on labors of love and can create, you know, functional games that are actually a ton of fun to play. Now, again, you're not going to play this for the, the for the eye candy, right? So the graphics are a level different, um, but I, I hope you'll see that. I think that don't let that eye candy deceive you. There's a lot going on under the hood in this engine that makes it a very interesting title. Now, that's kind of, I think, that big picture look. Let's jump in now and take a look at some of the features because there are quite a bit. We can see if we kind of hover over each one of these provinces, it gives us a lot of information. It kind of gives us the theater, who it's owned by, faction is the allies. We can see our forces in here, all popping up in these kind of text overlays as we hover over it. But let's take a look at some of the features and we'll kind of just do a, a light overview of them here. Here is our production screen, and we can see that we have uh, three, basically four things that are tracked here. We've got categories for resources, which are cash, food, oil, coal, and metal. These are the kind of the five supplies that we use, uh, the kind of the, the resources that we use to produce things. Then we have supply here and fuel, which are kind of elements that are going to go into consumption capacity or manpower, factory capacity. So you get start to get a sense there's a deep and rich engine underneath this game. So you don't want to let the you don't want to mistake the lack of flashy graphics for the lack of depth because there is a ton of data that's driving this engine. Replacements projected, we get aircraft replacements, tank replacements, troop replacements and repair points and then transport, which is they're not counters on the map. These are kind of abstract uh, capacities. We get convoy ships, troop transport capacity, and then strategic redeployment capacity. So the way these three are kind of enacted in the map is that it allows you to perform functions, but you don't have to worry about moving those counters around and keeping track of those. It's kind of a neat, elegant way to do that. Then we can see down below here, all the list of our cities and what we can do. And we could individually manage these. So we can see 100% of Berlin is used. It is producing cash at this moment. We go back, we can see Augsburg is producing supply and things like that. Now this, you can get pretty granular on this and kind of come in here and look at what each one is producing and tweak all of these things. Um, or you can use this manager, what allows you to kind of make some quicker calculations for this. But at this point, I don't want to go into full tutorial of these systems. I just kind of want to show you that they're there. And the basic point is, again, that there is a very rich uh, engine here for terms of production and manufacturing in the game. Also up top, I should mention, we can see that we've got uh, four lines for each one of these items, which is our current, uh, our stock, then what we're going to be adding in this turn perceived and what we're going to be using. And so you want to keep track to make sure that your ads are ahead of your usage. Otherwise, eventually you're going to run out of it and then are available down here as to what it would be kind of a change from last week to. So we've got um, 
a lot of information that you can use production wise. And that's a look at that system. And obviously, as you take more provinces, they start to add to your production capacity. Now, there's a research screen. This is pretty cool. Uh, 24 different elements that you can research in the game. And we can see right now we've got five that we can use. It's costing us 2.3 million of our 1.1 billion in cash reserves. And if we want to turn off, say, for example, submarines, and then say we want to take Germany in a nuclear direction, we could do that. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can um, kind of direct your nation, depending upon what your strategic military targets might be and what you're hoping to do in direction you're spoke, you know, kind of thinking to take the war. For right now, we'll, we'll just leave those on. We're going to do a shorter one. So we'll leave submarine warfare on, fighter, tactical bombers, armor, of course, that seems to make a lot of sense for Germany, and then refining because they're going to need oil here. Next up, um, we can talk about there's also, if you're running short on resources, there is a trade system. So say, for example, we want to get, we can see here, we can trade with Argentina because it's green and they have 22,541 tons of oil. We could come in here and create a new trade. Say we want to get their oil and it will calculate the rate here at which we want. So let's get all of their oil to 22500. So we're going to get all of their oil and we want to put it on repeatable. We're going to add it. Now we're trading for oil with Argentina and we can see it's going to cost us 16.4 million per week and it's a repeatable trade. Now it takes a while for the oil to get here and some of this oil could be lost because there's a very detailed strategic uh, supply system that's working under the hood here. So whether we actually get that much and how that works could be different, but we'll just leave that on for kind of fun. Now diplomacy, very easy, very elegant. We can see our screen over here in the right. If we wanted to say, for example, declare war against Denmark, it's Denmark neutral, declare war, and we would have declared war on Denmark. So there's a fast moving kind of elegant way to do this. Again, I, I hesitate to say it's a light heart, a budget Hearts of Iron 4. It feels more like a streamlined Hearts of Iron 4 in many ways to me. So I think, you know, there's our, there are three tutorials in the game. I watched the three videos. It took about a half an hour and I feel like I've got a rough idea on how to get Germany off the ground. I don't understand sea movement and kind of submarine warfare. And I don't understand yet how to calculate some of the strengths of units, but I'm starting to get a handle for how things work. And it's it's pretty quick. This you, you can I think you can play this game not well, but I think you can play this game with the minimal investment of time trying to learn it. Espionage screen, screen against again I think one of the it's it's a really elegant system. You can basically we have five points of espionage here. We can see that we're using one on ground intelligence against, against France. We're at war with Poland, so we got two factors there on ground intelligence against against Poland, and that gives you a better idea of the strength of ground troops on the on you know that we're going to be attacking. So we want that. We want air intelligence on Poland. These all make sense. We don't want to spend naval intelligence on Poland because we're not going to have any kind of naval warfare with them. We are spending one on naval for United Kingdom and one on ground intelligence on France. And if we wanted to come in, for example, and change these, we could just click on that button. Ground intelligence France goes one to zero. And we'll come back. And now we have one extra capacity and we're not doing anything with France. But let's actually come in here and put that back because we'd probably go into France next, right? So we'll leave that in there. That seems to make a little bit of sense. So we'll close that out. That is the uh, espionage screen. And then there are a ton of reports here, power, statistics, bombing, shipping. You can click on any of these and it gives you more data about your country. So you, if you are a data geek and want to know everything about your empire, you can certainly access it here. So that, I think, is a rough overview. Now, we haven't talked about supply. There's an intricate supply system and leaders. And we'll, we'll show a little bit about how combat works and things like that as we get into it. But there's, there's more to it. But those are kind of the big mechanics and the big tools, if you would, that you'd be using to guide your empire. Now, let's go invade Poland. So we're going to scroll over here. Germany, in case you haven't figured it out yet, is this gray elements. And Poland is this kind of beige 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 color here. Warsaw right here in the middle of the country is our goal. And we can see by kind of looking at some of these areas here, if we hover over Krakow, we can see that there are 17 infantry divisions. And we can see here we've got 14 German infantry divisions up here, three armor, a fighter and two tactical bomber. So a lot of our forces here in Breslau kind of stacked up here. So we're going to put together, now we're going to kind of think, we're already at war with Poland. The game starts that way. We're going to think of our strategic plan. Now, given that there is supply in this element here, what we want to do, I think, our basic plan is, I don't want to take on these 17 divisions head on. 
Instead, we're going to try to take our armor and our infantry, and we're going to try to slice them straight east to these two provinces above Krakow to kind of come to this point. We're going to take some armor and some infantry and have on the east part of our uh, kind of occupied territories here and have them cut directly northwest. We're going to try to encircle and trap these infantry divisions in Krakow to not have to fight them directly. If we can get that, it should open up, I think, the underbelly of Poland here. Then we can drive up in the second week and capture Warsaw and end the war in Poland. So now for, for making maneuvers and plans and stuff like that, it's actually pretty elegant. So say, for example, we're going to click down here in Presov, and we can see that we have on the left hand side, kind of above my head, we have two armies. We have the 7th Armor, which is over here, and then we have the 73rd Infantry. Um, wait, these armies here, let me check here. Yeah, we click there. Yes, uh, sorry, 19th Army, these are divisions. So we have the 19th Army, and then we have the 18th Army. We have two armies here on our very east. We're gonna take our, we're gonna leave our infantry there for right now. We're gonna click here, and we're going to kind of make sure that we get the armor selected here. Let's do that, where'd it go? Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong province. That's why, we're clicked on press off. We're gonna take our armored divisions here, we're gonna have them cut straight northeast up here. So we just right click on the province and they are now activated. We're going to leave our infantry, the, uh, what is this, the 19th army. We're going to leave them there. Now let's come over here to Uzgrabot and we're going to take all of our infantry, risking by leaving it open. And we're going to have them push up here as well. Then I think what we can do actually, now that I think of it, we want to come back to this armor. We're going to send our armor straight northeast and then northwest, kind of bringing that first half because the armor can go quite a bit further. So our hope is to punch through these forces here, cut northwest and encircle these divisions in Krakow. Now I'm going to go forward and kind of do some of the, the remaining land uh, kind of movements here. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit about what we're doing. Now, one thing I, I'm kind of halfway through that planning, but one thing that I want to do that they kind of show and highlight in the tutorial here is we're going to have the, we have uh, five infantry divisions here in Elbing. Instead of attacking full strength into Danzig, which would leave this abandoned, we're going to do this thing. We can click on the button here called attack assist, and then we get a blue arrow. And that means they're going to assist the attack. But if they in turn get attacked, they're going to hold their position. So it's kind of a way of doing a cautious defensive type of defensive minded attack that doesn't leave you exposed as you kind of do that. So we're going to have these units there do that. And we can see they have a blue arrow. However, over here, in Stalp, we're going to have all of our infantry divisions come into Danzig and try to cut off Poland from the ocean. So I just wanted to kind of show that there's some subtleties you can do in terms of attacking and defending that make you not have to commit everything going forward, given the fact, again, that this is a simultaneous turn based. So after we hit the end turn button, everybody's going to go at the same time. So what the situation looks like right now might not be exactly how it ends up when the actions are actually carried out. Alrighty, so we have plotted our rough kind of attacks here. We are going to send, we've got this massive 14th army that we're going to try to push straight east again and into Kielce with the armor spearheading it. We can see them down here. The infantry can go one province, but if we click again here, we can see that our armor can push perhaps two provinces, all goes well, and we can have them. So that should allow us to hopefully encircle much of this Polish army down here, which could be catastrophic for them, given that supply is a really big deal. We up, have up in the east and the north part of the country, we're going to have a push into an attack on Danzig right against the coast. Then we're going to avoid a pause then. We're going to come down through Grumba and into Lesno driving here, hopefully creating some sort of another pocket here. Now, we also have uh, air units as well. I should mention that. So if we look in Kohlberg here, we can see that we've got them selected. We've got here and we can see this is a tactical air bomber. It's right over my head. We're having them fly over Lesno to kind of assist in our attack there. Likewise, if we come down here to Breslau, we can see we have a fighter air group here that's going to assist on this infantry attack and we can continue on. We've got some tactical bombers that are going to try this because we want to push through here as quickly as we can and to bring a lot of force to bear there. Now, what I haven't done is I really haven't done anything to deal because I think technically we are at war with France, so they will probably do some strategic bombing on us. I'm not really doing much here, just kind of letting that sit. And we have a bunch of U-boats out here. I think I probably should send them out into the ocean here around the United Kingdom, but we're not going to do that either. Just to kind of keep things moving along uh, for this demonstration, I want to come in here and we're going to end our turn and we're going to see how our attacks against Poland work. So now we can see what's going to happen is 
the AI is going to do its things. We get executing unit orders, and then we're going to see some battle calculations. Turns to me seem to take about, so all our air forces are coming in here. Look at the air movement going. So there's a sequence of kind of execution that the AI is following. And turns seem to take about a minute or so. So there is a little bit of kind of you watch things happen after you move. But once it starts to get into the battles, it picks up pretty quickly. And you're kind of, you want to see, of course, how the battles are going to go. And we'll get a look here soon as to how the ground combat is displayed. But I think the big thing that struck me as I've played through this, so here we go. Here we're getting some combat. We can see all of the text that's coming up there, individual battles. Battle is complete. Um, planes lost, they lost, so it was an aerial battle here. We lost, we can see, like we lost four fighters and the Polish army lost 64. So I think that was pretty good. We'll take that. Let's close that. Things will continue on. So we can see France is pushing in with air power, strategic bombing on Hanover and Frankfurt. Yeah, not much we're going to do about that right now. We probably should have the Luftwaffe engaged there, right, to take try to take out the French Air Force. All right, so we got some ground attacks going here. We can see on the top right, troops lost. Polish forces are forced to retreat. Polish forces retreat from battle. We can see the losses down right here beside my head here. So we lost 7,000 troops. They lost 37,000 troops. Anti-tank guns, 15. We got 698 vehicles lost for the Polish army. And we can see the troop losses up on the top right here, 6,785. 37,287. So again, this amazing detail and this data that is being constructed and kind of uh, manipulated and used in this, uh, the execution of combat and the system that underlies this game. Huge advantage here. We have such force. We lost 1,500 men and they lost 46,000. Wow, 765 vehicles. The attack on Poland so far going okay. Now they have air power in here that we do not. But still, yeah, I think the German forces here are pretty strong. 5,400, they've lost 39,000. So Polish forces retreat. We've cut off Danzig. This is our push on the eastern part of the country. 4,000 troops lost to their 47,000. Polish forces retreat from battle. Now we should have those extensions because we want the armor, right? Here we go. The armor is going to push on more because we want to get that encirclement of those that big Polish army in the south part of the country. Here we go. Oof, so our armor taking on some pretty significant Polish forces, but we pretty much punched through their infantry. 4,000 troops lost for us, 22,000 for them. We lost 20 tanks, but we took out 653 vehicles. The encirclement, as we can see, we'll come back to it when it's done, looks like it's almost complete now. I should also mention, too, that, um, you know, the, the graphic, it's not an eye candy game, but when I get that higher resolution graphics on this full 27 inch monitor that I've got, they look a little bit sharper than they do right now. But I want to get the text big enough for us to see on video. So I'm using that lower resolution. So the resolution is significantly a little bit sharper, uh, considerably sharper when I'm playing on at the full resolution that my monitor can handle. So don't let that resolution. I mean, you can see kind of what the graphics are, but the resolution is a little bit sharper when I'm playing to get uh, at that full resolution for this monitor. This is 1360 by 768 for those of you that are technically in, uh, curious as to what it would be. All right, so we got the end of the turn. Combat is done. It looks like our encirclement went pretty well here. So we've got convoy interception. So again, that supply engine, there's a deep supply engine underneath this. Following the German attack on Poland, Nepal has joined the Allies. Okay, turn September 1, 1939 is complete. Processing end turn. We can see in the top left that the world has moved ahead a week here. So let's see how we did if we zoom in here. Pretty good. There are eight infantry divisions here and one armor. Now, I don't know. Again, that could be that our intelligence wasn't spot on. I'm not quite sure. But very satisfied that we've been able to kind of encircle these forces in Krakow. That's a pretty significant enemy force that we've basically been able to isolate. Now, and we've got armor here. We've got our 18th Army armored in division with three in armored divisions that can push up here into Lublin. We should have more armor here. Yes, the 15th Army is up here in Kielce. We can have them drive to Lutz and maybe to Warsaw. So that's going to be our goal now is I'm going to try to set up this. And I also want to kind of make sure I tighten the noose and don't leave any loopholes here on these forces in Krakow. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll probably push forward down here a little bit, keeping the pressure on these forces uh, in the western part of Poland as well. So hopefully we can take Poland in a two-week uh, affair here. So I'm going to plan those moves now.
All right, so we can see just right quickly here, we've got this armor, we've got them heading up into Warsaw, the drive to Warsaw, because we want to take out the capital and I think they should surrender then. However, now we've got some gaps here because these armored units are going to push on. So I want to show one thing here with this, um, with our massive 14th army. Uh, there are a lot of number, of, there are a number of things you can do with it. We can check for supplies and transit and stuff like that. But these double arrows large, allow us to change this grouping. And I don't want those 14 together because I want to push some of them here to Kielce so they'll, they'll be able to keep the noose up and keep the the the, uh, the stranglehold on those armies. So we're going to come into the reorganization. This is where we can see uh, von Manstein, the leader, and we have a whole mechanic for uh, leaders that we can put on. He's got a strategy of five, attack of five, and defense of five. So all these different elements that we can put, we could bring other leaders in, move them out of the theater and things like that. So there's another mechanic here that kind of addresses the capacity of leaders. But we're gonna split this. So we have 14 divisions on the left-hand side. We have now, just by pressing that one button, split them into two armies of seven divisions. And the, the one will have a generic leader and we can't bring any more leaders into this theater. So we're gonna leave that seven there. Now we can take this seven we're going to move them here to Kielce, leaving seven in their current location so that we'll be able to keep up the noose here on uh, Krakow there. All right, so I'm going to keep planning ahead. We'll kind of push around them. We're going to execute this and see if we're able to capture Poland here. All righty, I think we are set here. We've got, I've got basically, I'm kind of moving some of these infantry units in Kohlberg try to kind of fill in these empty gaps behind where we've, evac we've kind of um, evacuated by moving forward in the attack. We're going to press some attack through Lesno up here into Lutz and then Was Warsaw. We've got two kind of forks of armor heading towards Warsaw and then kind of rearrange these forces around Krakow to kind of keep the, this encirclement on these troops here. And hopefully, if all goes well, Poland will fall. Let's see what happens here. So we'll kind of walk through this turn. Um, as we watch this, I would be I'd be curious to hear what people think of the game and things like that. Now, obviously, I think I've spent about four or five hours with it. I did find the tutorials again pretty easy to watch and to be able to go through. So we got an air battle here. We've lost five planes. They've lost sixty-two. Yeah, we're kind of chewing up the the Polish army here, aren't we? Um, I like the tutorial system. Again, it took me about a half an hour to watch them and I felt like I was up to speed with the game. However, I don't feel like I know what I'm doing in terms of supply and production, uh, naval combat. I feel like there's a lot of depth to still explore. And I should mention that there is a hundred and over 100 page, I think 112 page manual that comes together with the game, PDF format, of course. Um, and I feel like to kind of get at some of those elements like the strategic bombing and things like that and supply, uh, the naval combat, how to conduct a U-boat warfare too. I feel like for me, that would be something that I really need to spend some time with. Well, this is a dead even battle and the defenders hold here. Interesting, where was that? Oh, didn't get much. Oh, so they brought, it was empty when we moved, we kind of sent forces to it, but this is another pretty even one too. We lost 32,000 defenders hold here. Not having much luck in the north here, but hopefully our armor and air forces, Polish forces retreat. Yeah, we only lost a thousand or so. They lost 18,000. Um, we kind of pushed through there. I do hope we can make it to Warsaw. It does look like they reinforced it a little bit. You can see now kind of getting a picture of what our allies in Japan are doing. But yeah, to go back to that, I do feel like there's a lot to kind of being able to play this game well, but I did want to kind of show what the combat looks like. Polish forces retreat. They lost 20,000. We lost 5,000. Here we go into Warsaw. We have three armored brigades and we kind of completely go in there. We lost 882 men. How many tanks? We lost six tanks, capturing almost 500 vehicles and knocking out 21,000 men. That should finish off Warsaw. Now, I do confess, I don't really have a sense yet either to kind of how, I, how you can predict unit strength, even given the consideration that things are kind of in flux with a simultaneous turn-based system. But I don't yet have a good idea for how I calculate like how strong a particular unit is, other than just general historically understanding that German forces kind of overwhelmed Polish forces, excuse me, in that attack. So that's kind of going on a historical basis, what we should be able to do, but I'm not quite sure how I'd be evaluating things. Um, and you also have to consider too that the intelligence network that you've got is going to determine some of your ambiguity in that situation, but um, not quite sure yet how you would calculate that type of um, uh, strength versus weakness in, in battle yet. So a lot to learn here, just kind of scratching the hood, I feel like, even though I do feel like the tutorials do a pretty good job of, uh, do a really good job of getting you uh, into the game quickly. So you can kind of play and then learn the rest as you go. 
Following the German attack on Poland, Saudi Arabia delivers diplomatic, severs diplomatic contacts with the Axis powers, and Oman joins the Allies. Turn eight is complete. Poland surrenders. So here we get again a little bit of a historical element to this. Poland is partitioned between Germany and the USSR as part of the secret Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So Poland has been cut out. We can see that they've all become gray now. And if we go in and look at our part kind of uh, production here, we can see that we have uh, some Polish cities that are producing things that we aren't using. So we would definitely want to go in and either use the production manager or go in and kind of take a look at those three, four, a bunch of them here, like about eight or nine. So this, I think the, the one comment I do have is I feel like the um, the production system can get pretty micro. And I think that I probably would tend to use this manager system quite a bit and then tweak things a little bit. I'm sure as you get more efficient at it, it would be faster. But right now, it, it, like, it feels a little bit kind of like a lot for me to go in and to manage the production for 10 cities. Maybe it wouldn't take that long, I guess, on those Polish cities. And I probably could have done it as we were going kind of thing like that. But I wanted to kind of keep this video moving along. But there you have it. Germany conquers Poland. We've taken a look at the game, taken a look at all the features, talked a little bit about some of the de design vision behind the game. I hope you have enjoyed this. Um, I would be very curious to hear what people think down in the comments down below. Let me know what you think of it. And again, one, you know, one other thing I would toss out there just in terms of, um, you know, one of the things I, I like indie game development. I love to see individuals and in small companies uh, take on labors of love and kind of uh, go for that big type of dream and try to build something that's pretty cool. This does seem like, you know, obviously the graphics you got in a graphics are your thing. This isn't your game. That's for sure. You know, but if you put that aside, you consider that a small team is able to create somewhat of a simulation like this. You know, if you'd like to support those types of endeavors, endeavors within the gaming industry, you might want to take a look at the game with that kind of thought in mind as well. But I think that brings us to the end today. I'd love to hear again what you think. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you in another video soon. This has been Destiny of the World.